As I say, get out of your heads that I'm a hero. I'm not. I'm just a dog-faced soldier. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight the makers of Hallmark cards are proud to present the true story of Major General William F. Dean, United States Army, and to salute him on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. For the next 30 minutes, you will hear the factual account of Major General Dean's life in the communist prison camps of North Korea. You will also hear the transcribed voice of General Dean. And now, here is our distinguished host on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. San Francisco Bay, a gallant soldier is taking a hard-earned rest. Major General William F. Dean of the United States Army has come home from the communist prisons of North Korea, home to stay. The free world has thrilled to the many tales of his gallantry in action prior to his capture, but of the black times that followed, little has been told. We're going to bring you the actual story now bring it to you from the lips of the men who lived it, and in the very words of their gallant leader. Here now is Frank Goss from the makers of Omar Cards. Whenever you want to remember a special person on a special day, let Hallmark Cards speak for you. They are the symbols of friendship, and they can carry your thoughts right next door or half a world away. And here's something nice to know. Even though the quality of Hallmark Cards improves through the years, their prices remain the same. So look for the Hallmark and Crown on the back of each card you choose. It always means you care enough to send the very best. All right, we're ready to record now. Oh, you are? Uh-huh. Well, I, wait a minute, how, how should I hold this thing? You're just up to your mouth there like that. Oh, that is? Okay. That, that's fine. Okay, well, um, like I was telling you, General Dean had ordered us to pull out of Ty John because the uh, yeah. group's in green, you see. It's green. And uh, he's a good general, you know. He's a good general. And uh, anyway, the truck, they was rolling out of town. And the general, he pulled out last because, uh, well, he, he wanted to make sure of all his men being out, you see. Can you tell so me many. Where, uh, Can you tell me where was he at that time? Where was, you mean the general? That's right. Oh, well, he was with the bazooka team. Uh -huh. And uh, the cook tank was coming in one side of town. We were going out the other. The road was being straight pretty heavily. I, uh, I remember they got one direct hit on a truck, killed 13 men. They were all up. Can you speak a little louder? Huh? You have to speak louder. They were all over the road. And uh, General Dean took us out into the boondock. Uh, bean field, you know? Uh -huh. We hid out there till it was dark. And uh, then we headed up into the hill. You mean about when he slept? Yes. That was dark, real dark. Around uh, all, all 1.30 hours in the morning. We're moving across the face of this here cliff. I was right behind it, General. He'd been carrying a wounded man, and he wanted to check back and see how the others were. Well, like I say, we were moving across this here cliff when General Dean started to slide. He went barreling down in the dark. Yeah, right out of sight. I mean, it was real dark, but I, I could hear him falling down there, bouncing. And that was the last you saw of Major General Dean? Yes, sir. That was the last any of us saw of him. It was on that dark night of July 20th, 1950, that General Dean became separated from his men. Lost and alone, his shoulder broken from the fall, he hid in the hills for 35 days until his capture. When the communists learned who they had, they took him secretly to a private house in Pyongyang, put him under heavy guard, and 
classified and top secret. Then they sent in an interpreter. General Dean tells of a meeting. I was captured on the 25th of August at night, and I met him early in the morning of the 2nd of September, sometime after midnight. We were together until the 2nd of October, about 10 p.m., when they moved me out. General Dean? Yeah? Permit me to introduce myself. Lee Gui Hyung. I am to serve as your interpreter. Interpreter? I don't need an interpreter. All I want is to get on to the POW camp. That is unfortunately not to happen yet, General. Well, look, Mr. Keegan. Hyun, General. Lee Gui Hyung. But I'd suggest you simply call me Lee. Cigarette? No, look, Lee. Explain to those soldiers that I've given them my name, rank, and serial number, and that's all that's required of me. How do you like your room? Nice, eh? They got you a regulation U.S. Army cot. And look. A chair for the general. And here, a rug. Uh, let's get something straight, Lee. I don't want any special favors. All I want is for your people to deliver me to a POW camp like any other captured American. You wouldn't like the POW camp, General. Take my word for it. It's not a matter of likes or dislikes. You were a very sick man, General Dean. I know. Why do you upset yourself? You have a very nice room here, nice bright light. Which burns 24 hours a day. And two nice bright guards with submachine guns. He's got your chiang tail. What did he say? He wants to know what the shouting is about. Tell him I want to go to a POW camp. I'm sorry, General. It is said you're a very important prisoner. Well, that's wrong. I'm just another soldier. That's not what they think, General. They think you know something very important. Things they ought to know. Name, rank, and serial number. Under the Geneva Convention, that's all they get. General, I'm a teacher of languages, not a military man. I don't know of these matters, but they tell me the Geneva Convention doesn't apply in your particular case. Of course it applies. Not to the dead. The dead? Yes, General Dean. Your own government has announced your death. It was on the radio. Yesterday. better today, General? I'm all right. Would you like to take a walk, General? Well, I'm not feeling that good. Your shoulder. Is it still bothering you? Mm, it would be nice if somebody could have set the bone. May we talk? You are a married man. Yeah. So am I. I am. I'm sorry about what your wife must feel. Uh, General, I want you to understand I am to live in this room until the interrogators are done with you. Although I know you're a capitalist warmonger, I should like to be a companion to you, someone to converse with. Yeah? Why? It would be very interesting to me and instructive. You see, I have never met an American soldier before. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Now have a cigarette. Uh, I don't smoke. And I think I ought to warn you, Lee, if you've been planted here to worm military information from me, you'll be wasting your time. Please. I'm not one of those people. You have my word for it. 
<laughs> Why do you laugh? Do you want me to believe you? I suppose that is impossible. At this stage of the game, yes. Then we will change the subject. I doctor. He has prescribed for your dysentery. He gave me some pills. They didn't do any good. You are very thin. I could say I've lost a little weight, yes. I used to weigh around 185. Guess I've lost 50, 60 pounds. <laughs> They give you a leave, won't you? You're only 20 miles away, as I could say. And uh, I felt sympathized with him because his wife had had a baby. It was about a month old, and his wife, unlike most Korean women, didn't have enough milk. And I'd say to him, it's only 20 miles. Can't they drop you by one of these nights so you can see how your family's getting along? I don't think you understand, General. I'm a member of the People's Army. The authorities won't let me go. I see. How do you like the book I brought you? It's all right. Some of the battle scenes are well written, but the propaganda, do they have to lay it on so thick? Please. You read doggone page. The Russians, they keep dying for the greater glory of Stalin. You can't tell me soldiers die that way. I know how they die. Perhaps you're right. It does get a little strong in places. Did you like it? I? Well, no. No, I didn't. You see, I don't like war. He couldn't understand how anybody could be a soldier in any cause. I mean, he told me that. He used to be a Christian. And he couldn't understand. I told him uh, I didn't know whether my son had made the military academy or not. And he said, I can't see. How you can let your son enter a profession where he kill other people and so on. I mean, he was a piece of any past man if I've ever heard one. And he was well read, loved good music, and tried to get me good literature. How'd the cooking lesson go? I don't know. I tried to teach her how to bake those apples the way you told me. But it didn't seem to make much of an impression. Well, well I gotta get something to straighten me out. The dysentery, is it worse? It don't seem possible for anything to be worse than it was, but it is, if you follow me. I spoke to the cook about not putting so much oil in your food. She said the guards like it oily. That's a cook girl that two years later was a captain doctor. <laughs> What's he say, Lee? He's pretty sore at you, General. Yeah? You see, the Americans bombed his village this morning. What's that? I'm not sure. He says they're here. They? Who? I'm sorry, General. Believe me, I am. It's the interrogators. In just a moment, we return to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. A few days ago, my wife came home from a shopping trip with a smile of triumph on her face. Frank, she said, you'll be pleased to know that this year I'm really ahead of Santa Claus. I've already ordered our Christmas cards. Of course, I complimented her on her farsightedness, and she told me how it happened. It seems she was in a store where Hallmark cards are sold and noticed that the new Hallmark Christmas albums had arrived. So she took time out then and there to browse through them. In other words, she said... I rested and accomplished an important errand at the same time. Well, you know, October is the ideal time to order the Hallmark Christmas card you'll want imprinted with your name. Selections are complete. Salespeople are unhurried. And by ordering now, you'll have your Hallmark cards at home in plenty of time for leisurely addressing. Yes, and you can count on it. 
The hallmark and crown on the back of the card you choose is your assurance of quality. It will tell your friends you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore continues the true story of Major General William Dean. And so the interrogation began. They came in pairs, their thick woolen coats buttoned tight, breath blowing white clouds in the dark chill air. And hour after hour, the questions endlessly repeated and interpreted and denied. And as each team tired, they were replaced. Crew after crew of the communists probing one mind, demanding one answer in that small back room. General, you have no choice in the matter. You are going to give us, him, the information he desires. I haven't got that information. And if I had, he wouldn't get it. We've been over this one a dozen times in the last 24 hours. What about Truman and his plan for world aggression? There's no such plan. I told you that 20, 30 hours ago. Couldn't get help, Oak Dale. You're lying. I have nothing to lie about. Could you not help you go, Oak Dale? We know all about you. The United States will not cease in their destructive efforts until all Asia has been enslaved for exploitation well, by now. the capitalistic war. I mean, you can see things if you're Monday morning quarterbacking, if you have more facts. I think we, he was just making face, looking uh, around the corner of how he could get out of it. The easiest way for you to purge your guilty conscience would be to make a signed statement repudiating Truman and his Wall Street cronies. You are a very vain and silly man to continue resisting the will of the masses. Have you no concern the for your interrogators wife? came in. My happy life ended because this one took my bed away from me and after about 20 hours or so, no, about the first 12 hours, I was shivering, my teeth were chattering, and that's why he got the idea it'd be nice if I just had me in shorts so I could really be cold. He was in an overcoat. He said it wasn't cold. Probably wasn't with that overcoat on. And but my teeth were chattering, so he said, what's the matter, are you cold? And he couldn't say it to me directly. He wants to know if you're cold. Tell him I'd appreciate it if he'd hurry up and get tired. I like to change off interrogator better. The other one's still sleeping. Yeah. Then when they pooped out, they took all took my bed out and let me sleep on the floor. But when they weren't looking, I'd sneak over on top of the rug. General. A uh, general, wake up. Huh. Lee. What is it? Are you ready to start again? No, General. They say you must be ready to move. Yeah, don't tell me I'm finally going to a POW camp. No, we're going to Payang, to the Department of Inner Security. What's that? I'm worried for you, General. That's the North Korean headquarters of the MVD. Papers or call up the UN, they'll tell them. 
Well, this one interrogator, when he's questioning, he always tried to start out nice, you know, like a, my best friend, and then he'd end up in a tirade. I remember I could believe he wasn't on that night when he said, I'm going to spit in your face. I mean, he told me he was going to spit in my face as a dog. Finally, he got so mad, he had pounded the table and threw it over. And I was so skinny, I don't know, I imagine I weighed 130 when I was captured. Well, since coming across the line, I think I probably weighed 110. The rockets from those saber jets are hitting closer. As long as they can take out the rail yards, that's all I care about. It's terrible up in the street, General. A lot of civilians are wounded, dying. I know, Lee. I hate that. But when you put military installations and supply dumps in villages, those places become military towns. Be careful, General, the glass. Pretty close one. They hit in my town two days ago. Where your wife is? Yes. Have you heard anything? No. I'm sorry, Lee. Yeah. Now I turn around and you say again. Get on your head. Yep, turn around here and so young enough. Cut. So young enough. You are to be executed immediately, General. Tell them something, please. Anything. Lee. You can tell them for me that I just assume they shoot me and get it over with. I'm too sick and too weak to put up with another week of interrogation, so you just tell them that. So lemon so lemon nida. That's how goes to Jan Tao. He'd rather spite you. Dying would be too easy for you. Huh? I guess you called his bluff. Oh, I thought he meant it. I've come to say goodbye, General. Goodbye? Lee, you going somewhere? No, you are. They're moving you again. I don't know where. For more interrogation? I don't think so. Or they'd be moving me, too. Oh. And, General, about the firing squad. Oh, yes, Lee. I don't think they'll try that again, General. I can't help feeling you've won. Goodbye, Lee. Goodbye, General. What is it they say? I'll be seeing you around. of the free world. But he continued to be held as the communist number one prisoner until his recent repatriation at Freedom Village. Let me tell you what had happened to Lee during this time. A week after saying goodbye to General Dean, he deserted communism, came over to our side and surrendered. And tonight, he's still in Korea, working for the United States Army. 
When General Dean stepped off the plane in San Francisco last week, he had just one thing to say. Get out of your heads that I'm a hero. I'm not. I'm just a dog-faced soldier. Let the people be the judge. privilege indeed to honor a great American like General Dean on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Now, next week, we're going to tell the true story of another remarkable man. We'll tell you about him in just a moment. It's an exciting story, and I'll know you'll want to hear it. But first, here's Frank Goss with news of something I'm sure you'll want to see. Have you ever thought how completely your Christmas cards reflect your personal taste? The color, the design, the mood of the card you select seems to say, this is how I feel about Christmas. This is the greeting I want to share with you. Now, many of you will soon be going to a fine store where Hallmark cards are sold to look through the Hallmark Christmas card albums. So you'll be glad to hear what these new albums have to offer in the way of beauty and variety. If you like Hallmark cards by famous artists, you'll find reproductions which have never before appeared on Christmas cards. Tile designs by Grandma Moses, pen and ink sketches by Steinberg, paintings by newcomers to the Hallmark Artist Series, like Doris Lee or Hulda or our own Lionel Barrymore. Yes, and among all the new Hallmark Christmas cards, you are sure to find the one you want imprinted with your name. Remember, the familiar Hallmark and Crown on the back of each card you mail will tell your friends you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Yes, Frank, there sure is a marvelous selection of Hallmark Christmas cards to choose from today. But, Frank, did you know that it was a 16-year-old boy who started this wonderful custom of putting Christmas in an envelope and sharing it with friends all over the world? Yep. It all started in London a little over a hundred years ago. A young engraver apprentice named Bill Egley read a story by a young author by the name of Dickens. It was called A Christmas Carol, all about a fellow named Scrooge, who's become quite an old friend of mine. Well, anyway, young Bill was so filled with the Christmas spirit that he sat down and designed and wrote and printed his very first Christmas cards to send to his family and friends. Yes, sir. Now, that is how the custom began. Mm -hmm. Well, Frank, what about a little preview of next week's Hallmark Hall of Fame? Next week, we're going to honor a man who has influenced your life every time you've driven up to a gas station and said, fill her up. He's Edwin Laurentine Drake, and he had the great vision and courage to attempt and finally succeed in drilling the first oil well in the world. How he did this makes an enthralling and gripping story. I hope you'll all be with us next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television on Sundays, starring Miss Sarah Churchill. Well, until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Gay. We wish to take this opportunity to thank radio station KCBS San Francisco for helping make this broadcast possible. The story of Major General William F. Dean was based on transcribed interviews with the general and was prepared for radio by James Poe. In the dramatic scenes, General Dean was played by Herb Butterfield. Also heard were Philip Ahn as Lee, with Ralph Ahn, Jack Edwards, Byron Kane, Clayton Post, Dan Coverley, Henry O., and Owen Song. Special music for tonight's broadcast was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true story of an inspiring moment in the life of a famous person. Next week, we honor Edwin Laurentine Drake on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs>